Hey, everybody, it's David Nagel. Welcome to the Successful Mind Podcast. My guest today is Jason Redman. Jason, how you doing? David, honored to be on. I'm good, man. And I'm really honored to talk to you. I, you have no idea of a wait for this. Uh, your story is absolutely amazing. And one of the, you know, one of the reasons that, that one of the things that resonated so much to me about your story is that it seems like there's both things that we learned in the military that saved our life. You getting out of that ambush and in, in eight, 1989, I got sucked through a, a dam in Illinois water skiing and they weren't looking for a live person. They were looking for a dead person. And everything the drill sergeants taught me when I went through training actually saved my life because I didn't panic. I was able to think my way through it with a broken back and deep puncture wounds and all kinds of stuff. So I'm, I'm, it, that's one of the things that I'd love to get into uh, yeah. with you, you know? So, so you have the, you have this book overcome and you, there's an amazing story in this. Can we, can we start with this? What made you want to get in the military to begin with? You know, I, I, um, I'm from the Midwest, from Ohio. You know, we, I don't know why we, we generate a lot of military members out of Ohio. And I grew up, you know, a, a family of service. Not while I was, uh, while I was um, young, but just my dad had served in the military. Both grandparents had served in uh, World War II. My great uncle actually was killed in World War II. So I just grew up with a love for our country and, and always wanted to do something uh, in the service. Uh, originally, I thought about being a pilot like my grandfather. And uh, he was a highly decorated B-24 pilot from World War II. And then when I was, um, I don't know, probably between 10 and 12, G.I. Joe was really popular back then in the, uh, I remember. <laughs> in the early 80s. And uh, I, was, uh, I was fascinated with um, some of the special operations guys, snake eyes, and some of these guys. And my dad said, yeah, you know, we got guys in the military that do that too. And he told me about some of the different units. And uh, at one point, he told me about the SEALs, uh, because up until um, really up until around 9-11, uh, SEALs, including myself, when I went through training, we went through Army Airborne training. Uh, and uh, my dad oh, wow. said, hey, there were these guys that went through airborne school with us. They're called SEALs. He's like, they're pretty badass. He said, their uh, training is tough. You may want to look into them. So I did, uh, you know, about the age of 14, I started looking and, you know, there was no internet back then. And really there wasn't a whole lot of information. The only thing I could find was their training was considered to be the toughest in the, in the U S military and some said in the world. Yeah. And, uh, and, um, and they were, and they were tough. There was not much information about them, which even piqued my interest more. So about the age of 14, I said, that's what I wanted to do. So, so then you, you were actually in the Navy for a while before you went into BUDS, correct? A, a couple of years. And really that years. was, I, I, w I came in specifically for that reason. Um, BUDS or SEAL training for those, anyone out there, BUD stands for basic underwater demolition SEAL training. So we call it BUDS and uh, BUDS was backed up. So uh, I was waiting for a slot and actually it was kind of a cool thing. I um, went through my primary specialty, which was intelligence. And then uh, they sent me to um, the East Coast SEAL headquarters. And I ended up getting to work there uh, for almost a year before I finally ended up going to SEAL training. I actually, I delayed my class starting because I wrecked my motorcycle three weeks before, you know, cause every young man needs a motorcycle when they join the military. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I, I wrecked mine three weeks before starting training. So that delayed me about four or five months uh, before I finally started in January of 95. So the whole, the whole idea was that you actually went, go through SEAL training. That was the plan ahead of time. It wasn't something you realized once you got in, correct? That's right. So right from uh, day one, I mean, when I was 14, although it was kind of funny, it's an, it, I tell the whole story of my first book, The Trident, the path was not a, a straight line path, that's for sure. Um, and I am a very unlikely candidate, you know, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm 45 now and I'm, uh, I'm 5'8 and about 170 pounds. Uh, I think the heaviest I ever was in my military career was about 178. 
But when I was 14, I was literally the 95 pound weakling. I was about four foot 11 and weighed about 95 pounds and walked in the recruiter's office and was like, you know, I want to be a seal. And they literally laughed me out of the office. Um, and, but I kept coming back and finally they chased me out enough that the army said, Hey, join, come join the army. Um, so I started to do that and the, I ruptured my eardrum when I was a kid and the army disqualified me. They said, Oh, you've got a bad eardrum. You're never going to be able to jump out of airplanes. And I was like, well, if I can't jump out of airplanes, I'm not joining the army. Yeah. So I left. And uh, during that time, I went back to the Navy station, the recruiting station, maybe three or four months later, and they had a new recruiter. Guy's name's Henry Horn. Every interview I do, I tell if you hear this interview and you are a retired Navy recruiter, Henry Horn from Lumberton, North Carolina, I would love to reconnect with you because I have not found this guy. But he, uh, he was like, hey, man, if you want to be a SEAL, I'll help you do it. And he really did. He helped me walk that path. And even though there was no direct path uh, like there is now, um, I wouldn't be a SEAL if it wasn't for Henry Horn. Wow. That, that's pretty interesting. Um, going, into, going into SEAL training or w- even before you went into SEAL training, did you have a vision of what the outcome would be when you came out of SEAL training? Did you know what you wanted to do with being a SEAL? Was there any ambition there? No, it's a, uh, uh, David, that's a great question. And I don't think I did. I had a love of country and I just, the goal was to become a SEAL. And, and I, will, I will admit this, there is, when you are young, uh, when you're a young man, uh, I think we have a little bit of a romantic view. You know, li- I grew up on G.I. Joe. I grew up on, you know, these war movies. And, and Hollywood, in my opinion, had not yet started making, or at least I wasn't watching movies that really showed war for what it is. Yeah. You know, we, you know, show the lone hero or, you know, the guys that, you know, make it out victorious. And I think I had a romantic view of what it is to be a warrior. And, um <clears throat> So I don't think I had that when I was younger. And the reality is um, I probably didn't even, you know, I think it's part of my story. If you read my book, The Trident, I probably had an immature view of what it is to both be a warrior and specifically to be a leader. And make no mistake, I try to explain this to people that are going in the military. Uh, The military is designed for one thing, and that's to wage war. And if you go into the military thinking you're never, ever going to see anything, that's a wrong mindset to have. I mean, I don't care if you're a cook. I don't care if you're a clerk. Uh, You never know what you could be doing that places you into harm's way. And I think it's important to have that mindset. And I I grew and matured as I got older through definitely the school of hard knocks and making some mistakes along the way and recovering from those before I finally saw the clear path to where I wanted to go. But I'd been in probably 10 years before that fully developed. Yeah. I, you know, that's something that I can very much relate with when I was, uh, when I was in the military, I was in the army, I was an MP and my station was in, in Germany. And the night that I got there or the morning that I got there, the, the Rhine main air base was actually, uh, I had a terrorist attack and the whole base got shut down and I got sent to Berlin, uh, in 1986 for a brief, because they couldn't process anybody in when I got there. And I had to go work, you know, basically checkpoint Charlie and saw a family get killed in the streets. And I was in such shock because they didn't tell us this. I did not know this was a reality, even though I knew we went to war and all of this. I think I had the same kind of romantic view about what it was going to be to be in the military. And I got a very crude wake up call from the moment that I got there. So that makes, that makes a lot of sense to me. And you had some leadership challenges, correct? I did, uh, you know, with that immaturity. And I think sometimes it is, uh, you know, <laughs> leadership's hard. Uh, you know, there's, I mean, I've written, you know, books on it now and, uh, and people try and say, oh, you're a leadership expert. And I'm not, man, I am a student of leadership. I'm still learning all the time. I still make mistakes. And I think any good leader recognizes that's how it's going to be. It's a, it's a journey that'll never end. And I, uh, I got off course. Um, I think frequently, uh, I see this more with young men than I do young women. Uh, but young men, if we find success at an early age, um, it, it's easy to build some arrogance and pride. And I, I started getting this and I was, I, I was 
19 when I became a SEAL. So I graduated from SEAL training and became a SEAL and suddenly started doing these amazing things. I mean, traveling the world and, um, you know, gifted with doing um, strategic level impactful missions. I mean, counter drug operations down in Central and South America and, you know, in charge of millions of dollars of equipment and, you know, starting to get into lower level positions of leadership all pre 9-11. But um, I started to excel. And, you know, they were like, yeah, hey, man, Red's doing a great job. Let's move him to this next level. Let's make him a instructor. Let's so oh, Red should become a officer. And, um, and I think a lot of that kind of culminated with arrogance. And I really started to think, man, I'm like, awesome. And, and it continued because when I headed to school, um, I joined the Hampton Roads Naval ROTC, which at that time was the largest ROTC consortium. It was uh, three schools and we had about 350 officer candidates and midshipmen, um, which was the largest on the East Coast. And I, I don't know if it's I, I don't think it still is to this day. But when I was there, it was and it was my goal. When I got there, I was like, I'm going to run this place. <laughs> And I did. I worked my way up to become the battalion commanding officer uh, and left and, you know, graduated summa cum laude from ODU with a degree in business management and the battalion commanding officer and was ranked number one when I left. Came wow. back to the SEAL teams thinking, I'm God's gift of leadership. You know, I'm like Patton incarnated. Um, but the world had changed. 9-11 uh, occurred while I was at school. And when I came back, here I was thinking that, you know, I know all this stuff. Well, I knew a lot of stuff in a war, in a peacetime military. And overnight, everything had changed. Our tactics had changed. Uh, I, I went from being like this super experienced guy to coming back as a brand new officer, leading guys who had been in combat. And my pride and arrogance, I think, got in the way of humbling myself and, and, and instead of saying, wow, even though I had, you know, I, I was, uh, I'd been in 11 years when I got commissioned and, uh, instead of being like, Oh, you know, I need to listen to these guys. They've been in combat. I was like, Hey man, I'm Jason Redmond. I've, you know, done all these things, you yeah. know, I know this stuff and I didn't. And it kind of created this perfect storm uh, where a lot of leaders make these mistakes. We step into new positions, new organizations, and we, we may have some great skills, but for whatever reason, maybe we don't know and we're not willing to humble ourselves and, and pull the people in around you who could really help you. And just by saying those simple little words, hey, man, I don't know how to do this. Would you be willing to teach me? because we're too proud as a leader to admit we may not know how to do something and we think it's a weakness as a leader. And it's not, yeah. you know, um, the very small people in your team that would ever think that aren't worth worrying about. The vast majority of people out there respect leaders who are trying to get smarter. And I'll tell you what, it makes people feel good to have a leader come to them and say, hey man, can you teach me? You're the subject matter expert. And I failed to see all that. And uh, uh, so, making mistakes, hanging on too tight, not asking for help. And then I did the age old American military thing. I, uh, you know, turned to the bottle in my spare time. And uh, that's just water, by the way. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> turn, to, turn to the bottle in my spare time and um, really just continued to kind of damage my credibility as a leader. And, and all of that came together in a perfect storm on a mission we conducted in Afghanistan, where I, I made uh, the call to take myself and a machine gunner down off a, a, a high position to try and support a unit that was down in the valley below in a gunfight. And it was a bad call. I shouldn't have done it. And my leadership said, don't do it. But I, once again, was, hey, I'm going to do you know, what I think is right. And, uh, and that was kind of the collision point, the perfect storm uh, that came together that really um, my leadership said enough. Uh, guys I worked with were like, we don't want to work with that guy. He's dangerous. He's going to get somebody killed. And, uh, and it really started this whole new path, uh, a very hard, long, dark path that I walked um, where I had some guys who said, kick him out. And thankfully I had leadership that believed in me that did not kick me out. They, they gave me some unique opportunities to, um, to grow up really. One of those unique opportunities was to head to us army ranger school. 
And uh, I went to ranger school at 13 years in my career. Um, that, you know, combat veteran, you know, experienced guy, prior enlisted officer, but I was not a good leader then. I was, you know, I was leading through uh, one of the mistakes that a lot of leaders make. And that is, hey, look at me, I'm the leader because of this, you know, thing I have on my collar or because yeah. the sign on my door says, boss, you should follow me. Um, and instead of, you know, motivating, inspiring people by your actions and, you know, so, uh, got to ranger school and, um, <laughs> and I'll, I'll cut this story short. I won't go too deep. I tell the whole story in the trident, but, uh, there was a pivotal moment in ranger school that really turned my career around. And I will say that there were a couple of people, a very seasoned seal commander and the ranger school battalion, uh, colonel in charge of the school who saved my career um a very pivotal moment that once again ego and pride and emotions get in the way and they saved my career and uh and finally i think for the first time i kind of came to grips with hey bro you are not as great as you think you are you know you, you're not god's gift to leadership as a matter yeah. of fact you know you talk about being a good leader but you're not so um and and that pivotal moment, that leadership, that leader, the SEAL leader gave me the most succinct leadership advice I'd ever been given. Uh, and to this day, it's what I try and live by. And that is people will follow you if you give them a reason to. And uh, uh, beautiful. because I'll be honest, I was convinced after a whole bunch of things had happened that I'd never be able to go back and be successful in the SEAL teams again. I almost decided to get out of the military and he said, hey, man, people will follow you if you give them a reason to. He said, it doesn't matter how bad you mess up. Some people, you know, some people will never buy, you know, your BS ever again. That's just the way it is. But he said the vast majority of people, if someone is leading, if someone is displaying the of leadership, if they're an example, people will follow you if you give them a reason to. It's just natural. We want to follow people that are doing the right thing, that are making right. good choices, that are successful. It's just human nature. And he told me that. And he said, now go back to that course and crush it and come back to the SEAL teams and give the guys a reason to follow you. And uh, that was the spark I needed. It was the spark I needed to do that and to, uh, and to fix myself. So, you know, and I wasn't perfect. I, I made plenty of mistakes after that. But at least I was humble enough and, and very self-aware from that point further to, uh, to drive forward and really started a whole new journey of understanding and, and trying to be a better leader. Yeah. And then, so how long was it between that and when you were, went through the ambush? How many, was that a long time or is that short period of time? Uh, a few years. A few yeah. years. Yeah. So you had some real growing and changing and working on yourself and developing yourself during that time before you ended up in this other situation. I did. And, and what's interesting, and this is one of the big things I talk to people about the overcome mindset you know, 2020, as much as people hated it, uh, I tell them, you know, congratulations, you know, as long as you didn't lay down and wither and just die, you know, physically, emotionally, or mentally, then guess what? You got better from 2020 because that's what adversity does for us. Learning how to deal with hardship and, and change and, and, you know, problems is really what builds an overcome mindset. It's like a muscle. And uh, I often say, there, there's no doubt in my mind, the path that I walked, um, the leadership failure was the hardest path I've ever walked. I mean, because really I came back, you know, there were a lot of guys, even to this day, I got guys in the SEAL teams that hate my guts, hate my guts. Okay. They, they would love to see me dead. Um, well, that may be a little harsh, but they definitely don't like me. And the reason being, because I messed up and, you know, we're a community that doesn't really tolerate that very well. And I think they would have been perfectly happy if I had just left. And I didn't, I stayed, yeah. I, I grounded out. I slowly earned the trust back of a lot of guys. And uh, that was, but it was the hardest thing I've ever done. You know, there was often times where I've felt, man, like a, uh, we're a very team-based community and I felt like a loner. I mean, I definitely got ostracized for a while as I slowly earned back the trust and my credibility. But the interesting thing is that path, walking it, set me up for success when I got horrifically wounded. Because when I got wounded, I was like, well, this sucks, but, you know, you just got done with that, the hardest thing you've ever been through. 
So if you went through that, guess what? You're going to get through this. This is different, but you know, at the end of the day, it's the same. It's about grinding forward. It's about putting one foot in front of the other, and it's about doing what needs to be done to get to the end of this journey. And um, any time now that I've been in any kind of major crisis or what I like to call life ambushes, um, th that's the formula. And the more you go through, the the easier it is. Uh, well, I don't want to say the easier, but you you uh, you you've conditioned that muscle to be able to do it. Yes. Did you have this incredible positivity before you went through your leadership crisis, or do you think that was developed as you went through it and learned? I think probably as I went through and learned. Um, I, I would tell you that I am. I mean, I'm a pretty optimistic person, but I don't want yeah. to say I was naturally like this, you know, glass of milk, half full kind of guy. Uh, <laughs> there were definitely more guys that I worked with who, uh, when the chips were down, were, you know, the rays of sunshine in those moments. And thank God for having them around. Uh, but I think it was something that I developed. And, and, and I think I just realized it by going through hard times. I mean, your attitude truly does determine the outcome. Um, what I tell people is it's not always the outcome you hope or think it will be. And that's a hard thing for people to wrap their head around because yeah. oftentimes I meet people that suffer a life ambush and they're so laser focused on an outcome that they can't deviate from that outcome, even though everything around them is not going to allow that outcome to happen. Um, so you got to be flexible. You got to realize, you know, hey, this is where I was. This is where I'm stuck. That's where I want to go. But the reality is it may be 90 degrees from here. But no matter what, I'm not still stuck on that same point. Right. You talk and, about in your book about getting off the X. Yes. Right. Getting off the X. Could you explain that to everybody what that means? Yeah. So I survived a pretty vicious uh, Al Qaeda enemy ambush, my team and I. And, uh, and, um, we estimate anywhere from uh, 10 to 12 AK-47 shooters and two PKM machine gun shooters had my um, um, six-man team pinned down. I was hit eight times in that fight. My uh, medic was hit, uh, uh, took a round directly below the knee that almost severed his leg off. Uh, one of our other guys was hit three times and just a vicious, vicious firefight. And we... When you are on, when you're in an ambush, a uh, weak point of attack, the X, whether it's a IED ambush, whether it's a sniper attack, whether it's a, you know, machine gun ambush, like we found ourselves in. And uh, my entire military career, I had worked to try and put the enemy on the X. And uh, fortunately, though, we also train that what happens if you get on the X and the, the secret to success is you have to get off the X as quickly as possible. The longer you sit on the X uh, in any kind of ambush, uh, the harder it is to get out of it. And my team did an amazing job. My team, uh, the Air Force AC-130 gunship, and a lot of the other assets, I mean, all helped us get off the X. But it was definitely my team leader and my team's actions that got us off the immediate X and driving forward. So fast forward, you know, um, almost 10 years, well, about eight years. Over that period of time, I'd retired from the military. Um, I had launched my own nonprofit and was working with wounded warriors, a lot who had been through some pretty major trauma. And I started working with businesses and individuals who also had suffered adversity or crisis or trauma or whatever they'd been through. And one day I just had this epiphany and I was like, holy smokes, man, people react the same way. Businesses and people react the same way when they have uh, a major trauma or life ambush, as I call it, as people do in a gunfight. You know, our, our reactions are almost the same. And the other thing that I realized is the, the human body doesn't distinguish. Your brain does not go, oh, I'm in a gunfight. I've got to ramp up our fight or I've got to crank things up to the I'm in a gunfight, fight or flight scenario. Okay the human body and the brain only goes, you're in a crisis and it kicks in the adrenaline and all the different things that occur when we're in a specifically a life or death situation. But sometimes, you know, it could be, it could be a financial crisis. It could be a, you know, it could be a massive relationship crisis, whatever it is and kicks into that fight or flight, but tendency to do the same things. We, we hunker down, we freeze, uh, when the suck factor is really high, we try and wish it away. Yeah. 
You know, we do all these things. Many people do the ostrich. They stick their head in the sand and they just kind of pray it'll go away. They're in denial. And, um, and I realized that. And I realized, holy smokes, man, so many people get stuck on the X. And I was at that point that I realized, man, all the things that I got taught in my SEAL career and the things that enabled me to be successful, they apply to anyone and uh, develop this react methodology, which is a system to get off the X and to teach people that when you sustain a life ambush or when you sustain a major crisis, if you apply these things, um, you will get off the X faster because most people waste so much time when crisis occurs, whether you're a business or an individual. Um, like I said, we have a tendency to be in denial. We have a tendency to, one of the big things we do, we look back on what we've lost. Well, I want that back. I want back my successful business. I want back my successful marriage. I want back my health, whatever it is. Um, the other thing we do, we have a tendency to look for someone or something to blame. And then the other thing we do is we look at the future at where we wanted to go. And then, you know, we're like, but that's where I want to be. Well, none of that matters. Yeah. When you're in a crisis, there's only one thing that matters. That's getting off the X quickly as possible. You figure out the other stuff, which most of it doesn't matter anyways, because you can never go back and change the past. When a crisis happens, all you can do is drive forward and learn from it. And that's really what I teach and, and it works. And it's been exciting to watch so many people out there adopt this mantra um you know i have businesses that like it's become their slogan we got to get off the x and uh and it works i wouldn't be here and i wouldn't be successful in what i've done without it so how did you so when you were in the ambush how did you get off that x because i mean i i would i listened to your book you said that the, the, these people were shooting from like 50 yards away or 50 feet away something like that like it was incredibly close there was a crossfire going on how the hell did you guys get out of that situation and you sustain your fatal wounds i mean like you talk about like there's the golden hour or the something like that you refer to but which i wanted to ask you about that also because you were really pushing the time on that to actually get medical help correct yeah, absolutely. So, so two things. I mean, one, uh, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my teammates and, and all the external things. And that's sure. an important thing. Um, but two, I, I definitely am still here, A, by the grace of God, and B, by focusing on controlling what I can. And that's a really important thing to understand in any kind of crisis. Um, like I said, we have a natural tendency, and I don't know, it's human nature. We, we focus on what we have no control over. Um, I can't control the gunfire that's coming at me directly. I mean, indirectly you can, but directly you can't. So, um, so I, I focused on what I could in those moments. I knew I was out of the fight. I, I knew, you know, I was all shot up. I was mangled. I couldn't think straight. So I was like, well, what's the one thing I control? Well, I can, I can control trying to stay alive, you know, and that became my focus, stay awake to stay alive. My, my teammates really did the rest. And this starts to get into this react methodology. Um, R stands for recognize. You have to recognize, you know, that you're in a crisis, that you're in an ambush. Obviously that was pretty obvious for us. We recognize that pretty quickly. The, the next step is E, you've got to evaluate your assets and what's in your inventory. And this is where, you know, my guys did a really good job. They, they recognize, you know, we had um, Army Special Operations medevac helicopter on standby with a flight medic. Uh, we had the AC-130 gunship, we had drones, we had these different things that we started incorporating these things. Life's no different. You've got to look at what assets do you have to bring to bear. Stop thinking about the suck factor. Stop thinking about what you've lost or the pain. Start thinking about what assets you have to bring um, to the equation. A is assess possible options and outcome. And, uh, you know, my, my team leader did a really good job. He knew uh, over about a the firefight lasted about 40 minutes. And over that time period, we were running out of ammo. Uh, and he recognized that, you know, if we ran out of ammo, we would be overrun and there was no place for us to go. So he recognized the only real asset he had was that AC-130 gunship. But unfortunately, we were so close, um, we were well within what we call danger close parameters, meaning that if the gunship brings in its rounds, there's a high probability it'll hit us and kill us. But he was very smart and he figured out 
basically how to execute that mission working with the gunship. I won't get into the details, but they just did a great job and managed to take the enemy out. And then he ran forward and got me, got a tourniquet on my mangled arm and uh, executed multiple more fire missions before finally they were able to bring the um, medevac helicopter in. I focused on what I could control. Um, you know, I, I asked him, you know, I was still muscle memory plays an interesting thing when you've done it so much. So, I mean, I was asking him questions, you know, do we have a full head count? Do we have this? Do we have that? And, you know, he was like, Hey man, I got it red. I got it. <laughs> he did. I owe my life to that guy. And, uh, but the, the really, my focus was on stay awake, to stay alive. I mean, it is probably the greatest fatigue I've ever felt. Everything in me basically wanted to go to sleep. Um, and, and I knew that if I did that, I would never wake up again. So, uh, that's what I focused on. And when the medevac helicopter came in, that's what, uh, you know, they, they got me out of there and got me and my teammates to the, to the Baghdad ER and those, uh, that whole team of incredible medical professionals, you know, ended up saving my life. But, yeah. um, going back to the, the, the last two steps, uh, C of react is choose and communicate. So, um, my team leader had all these different options and he chose, he said, you know, even though we're danger close, even though this AC-130 says, man, if we bring this in, we're going to kill you. He knew there was no other choice. It was the best of the bad decisions. And he chose that. And then he communicated it to the rest of us. He said, Hey, I'm calling in this fire mission, stand by, get ready. And, uh, and I remember, man, you know, I could hear the rounds go off and, you know, there's a, a pretty good period of delay before they hit the ground. Um, and then the last one, you got to take action, you know? So this is the react methodology. And in my book overcome, I get deep into the weeds on how you apply it in different crises, but you know, the, the it, it works in a firefight and it'll work in any other crisis you have in your life. And yeah, uh, and it, it's a fantastic book and, and everybody needs to get it. Also, you do the audio on the audio book, which is what I listened to. And you did a fantastic job on that too. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I was glad to be able to do it for overcome. I missed the window on Trident. So, but the yeah, guy that did Trident did a great, great job also. Daddy, I haven't, so I haven't gotten into Trident yet. I just actually found out about that through listening to the, to your interviews and, and, and such, but I'm going to, I'm going to check it out. It sounds really amazing. What, so, so now you have this business where you're actually helping people learn how to do this. Tell us about that. Yeah. So, I mean, gosh, life is hard, you know, the, the struggle, whether it's in business, I'm an entrepreneur, so I know how hard it is. You ride the roller coaster of ups and downs yeah. and, um, you know, there's health, there's health crisis, there's relationship crisis, there's financial crisis. So, you know, Often people are like, man, how have you found success in your life? Well, I've applied the things I learned in the military. So now I'm, I'm trying to teach other people those things. So whether it's through speaking and, you know, developing different presentations to help businesses, you know, I teach the five principles of elite performance. Uh, that's more of a organizationally focused theme. I teach the six tenets of success. That's more of an individually focused thing. Uh, obviously I'm teaching how to get off the X I'm teaching the Pentagon of peak performance, how you can find balance as a leader. And in 2021, I am launching a whole new program. I'm really excited about it. It's, it's been many, many years in the making and, um, really it's a culmination of everything that I've written about and, you know, kind of another epiphany with the get off the X moment. Um, it's called the point man for life program. And what I realized is, you know, David, you're familiar with point men in the military. Yeah. Uh, a point man is an individual who is a leader. They lead us to where we need to go, but there's so much more they do than just that. And I realized there's four principles that really great point men have that makes them incredibly uh, uh, successful and, and irreplaceable if you have a great point man. And I realized that if you apply these same principles in life, you're going to be successful. I don't care who you are. If you can follow these principles, you will find success regardless of what happens. 
once again, it may not always be the outcome that you thought it was going to be, but you will be successful following these principles. So that's the newest program I'm launching in 2021 and building both coaching and online courses around that. So, uh, and a, um, I'm launching a new point man planner, which basically teaches these principles and how to, um, how to follow them in your own life, both weekly through the assessments and the tools that I've developed. Where, if the listeners are interested in learning more about this, where can they go? Uh, JasonRedman.com. So everything Jason will be Redman. there. Okay. Yep. And we'll make sure everything's in the, in the, in the tag and the drop down on all of this. Your story is just so I could talk to you for hours. It, it is just so incredible. If what I ask all my guests to do is if you could leave everybody, I know that there's more than one, but if you could leave everybody with a successful mind tip, what would you, what is like the best thing that you could leave everybody with that they could apply today? Absolutely. So one of the things that I teach, it's part of the uh, point man for life program and the point man planner we're inundated with so much information and so many distractions in this day and age. And I developed a simple tool to try and make sure that every single day I'm moving the needle in my life. Um, and, and this simple tool is called the rule of three Ps. And it, it's just a very simple goal setting formula um, to, to keep you on course, despite all the distractions that, you know, we'll have day in and day out, you know, all the blips, dings, tweets, bangs, whatever it is. Yeah. And the rule of three P's is this. If you wake up every day and you write down these three goals, they don't need to be big. The problem is too many people try and take too big of a bite at a time, you know, just a, a tiny little chew every day. And the three P's are one physical, one personal, one professional. So I am a big fan of taking care of yourself physically. And it doesn't mean, you know, you don't need to look like Mr. Olympia or be a CrossFit champion. It just means move your body. It means get out and go for a walk. It means, you know, go through the Frisbee with your dog. I don't care what it is, but spend at least 10 minutes a day or more build on it doing one thing physical. Number two is professional. Um, most of us uh, have the goals we need to get done in our business, but oftentimes there's always fire things. There's the little things we need to do that truly will move our business forward and will move ourselves forward. So make some time to do at least one little thing that moves that needle. Um, you know, even if it's only 30 minutes out of your day, block yeah. that time off and say, this is what I'm going to do professionally. If you're a student, Maybe it's something as a, uh, you know, as a student within your education, maybe it's, man, I really got to put more time and effort into calculus because I'm really struggling. So maybe I need to get a tutor and I need to be getting, you know, tutored weekly to bring my grade up from, you know, a C to a B or whatever it is. That's the one thing that will help move the needle. And the last one is personal. We have a natural tendency to, to not actually schedule our personal things that we need to get done. They end up getting put on the back burner, but do something personal every day. And when I talk about personal, that can be personal relationships. You know, maybe it's, I'm going to call my mom today, or maybe it's, I'm going to have dinner with my family today. Um, or maybe it's, I'm going to, you know, balance my personal budget today, whatever it is, do one thing that takes care of yourself personally. If you do that, it, it creates balance and it accomplishes two things. Uh, it accomplishes structure and progress. Uh, structure, because every day you're writing down these three things and progress at the end of the day, no matter how bad your day went, if you make sure you put in, you know, roughly the hour to 45 minutes to knock these things out, you're going to be able to look in the mirror at the end of the day and go, you know, no matter what went wrong, I knocked out my three Ps. Tomorrow's a new day. And uh, if you do that, every day, you will move the needle in your life. You will be more successful. Yeah, that's, I think that's great. That is such great advice. And it covers all the main areas of your life. So you're, you know, and the other thing is that so many people don't measure their, their progress. They just don't measure it. They get so stuck in what's going wrong or what their, what their challenges are. They're not actually measuring the progress. So I love that advice. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, you have been extremely generous in sharing your story today. And I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for your service to our country. You're an amazing human being. And, uh, you know, I really celebrate you and everything that you're doing and where you're going. If there's anything we can ever do for you, just let us know. We'd be happy to help in any way. David, thank you, man. And you too. Thank you for your service also as a fellow vet. 
uh, you know, I, it's, it's amazing. We're having less and less that are serving. And I know that you learned a lot from yours, like I did from mine. So much yeah. appreciated. Thanks for coming on. All right, everybody. This has been absolutely amazing. If you know somebody, especially if you know a vet, uh, that needs any help, we're, we're in a tremendous situation where we're losing a tremendous amount of vets. I think it's like 22 vets a day. It's, it's incredible. Uh, what's happening, uh, inspiration, uh, actual techniques, uh, help of any kind. And if you're interested in what Jason is doing, first of all, get his book, absolutely get overcome. Um, it is, it's amazing. I mean, I just, I've read it once and it's, it's already changed my thinking around several different things. Um, go to jasonredmond.com and learn all about this incredible human being and what he's doing. Thanks again, Jason, for coming on. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, Dave, my honor. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy, happy New Year.